so uh, we're just following up on uh, the previous lecture where we left off was that we assumed that you can measure everything infinitely precisely. And then, um, you know, with, with uh, TensorPlan, things worked out pretty well because you had consistency checks that were basically just like, is this number equal to zero or not? And then if you, if, if you did it that way, then like you had a linear algebra kind of argument for why TensorPlan is correct and why it finishes after a while. But all of this is kind of a, a huge um, assumption. I mean, you can't, obviously you can't measure things infinitely accurately. So this lecture is all about what you do with the noise, with, with when you measure something, that the fact that you're not entirely 100% accurate uh, and, and how, do you, how do you deal with that? So that's um, gonna be the eluder sequence part. And then there's gonna be a bunch of extensions uh, depending on how much time you have. Um, okay, so, so just to recap, we had this discriminator, which was a concatenation of a scalar and the vector, uh, interproducted with this one concatenated with theta. Um, and so we had that, you know, the product of, of, uh, of these, uh, one, one of the disc discriminators has to be zero for consistency, and then the product of these has to be zero, and then you can express that as, as like a, an inner product of tensor products, and then this number has to be zero. Uh, but obviously we can only measure this approximately, so we can't test for this condition. Uh, we, can't, we can't see this inner product exactly. So instead of this d which you know this thing is called d this this uh, this um um tensor producted measurements we can we can measure something like d tilde uh which is going to be oh, by, well, by the way I, yes? I called it d because it's data mm. okay mm. so <laughs> so maybe okay it's not the ideal version of the data but the data you see does that make sense so you've got the tilde d because you can't, you can't actually measure this, right? But what you can do is you can, you can do n different measurements for each action. So like you're in a state and for each action you do n trials of observing the reward and the transition for state S and action A. And then, and then you record, you know, your, your capital R a and I will be your, your rewards for, the, for these measurements and your S prime will be your next date. So then you can kind of calculate this like one over N, like you basically calculate the average measurement vector, right? And so the idea is if you take enough, if, if N is large enough, then maybe you can prove that this, you know, it, it has to be, you know, something like this inner product that used to be zero, will now have to be like small in absolute value. So that's the, the first idea that you, you're gonna take a lot of measurements and then you take averages. So how does this work? Uh, well, we know that for A equals A star, that is the optimal action. This, this delta was, was zero, right? So the delta is, oh, uh, sorry, the, the, just, just for that action, this inner product with this is going to be zero. So like we're, we're looking inside this, tensor product um, if it was measured accurately. And so the question is, if it's measured not exactly accurately, then uh, you can prove that the absolute value is small. And this is gonna be something like the Hofting inequality where what we're doing is we're taking this uh, mean, this experimental kind of, kind of like, uh, you know, um, the average of, of our measurements. And we know the expectation is zero. And since we take n of them, uh, then like we can prove that the absolute value is small, depending on how many samples we take. But obviously, if we, if we take enough samples, then we can get down to some small data. And then for, for any other, and, and this is because, yeah, for, for the optimal action, the, the Bauman equation holds. Like this is from last lecture. That is why this data had to be zero. Um, and then for any other action, um, you have basically the, the true, you know, accurate value is is uh, uh, from like zero to age or from minus age to age. It's like it's it's got an absolute value of capital H. Capital H is the number of uh, 
stages. So that's the, the, the highest value you can get. Um, so yeah, if you take measurements there, then like they're going to be upper bounded by delta plus h. So then the product of all of these, which is going to be the delta that we measure, um, is, is going to be upper bounded by delta times delta plus h to the a minus one, which is, you would think huge, but what, what if we can make that a tiny, absolutely tiny, uh, we actually make this super small, like less than epsilon. This, this quantity, it's going to come up later. It's just, this is a kind of like a, a slack that we need to, to put in, but, but don't worry about this. The, the point is we make this tiny by making delta tiny. And for this, we need delta squared number of measurements because of hoping. Usually you, you take for an accuracy of epsilon, you take epsilon squared times log factors, you know, log in the probability that, that you want to succeed with. Uh, I, guess, of... I guess you want to say one over epsilon squared or one over data squared, not data squared. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, absolutely. This is one over data squared. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, like, okay, so what we do is we take this huge number of, of measurements for every action, but still like polynomial in, well, h to the a. Um, so like if a is, is order one, this is still good. So you take this, num this number of measurements for each action and you calculate the, the average, and then you calculate your, your d tilde, which is going to be small in absolute value if there is a consistent action. So that's, that's how you change the thing. And then what you do is, um, you know, if, if, you, if you observe an absolute value that is greater than epsilon, then there is an inconsistency because it, it actually had to be, it should have been less than epsilon over this slack thingy, which again, let's not care too much about the slack. It's gonna make sense later. But okay, but if there's greater than epsilon, then we say we, we see an inconsistency and we add a requirement that this thing has to be less than epsilon over the slack. We add this requirement and we start again with an optimistic choice of theta that satisfies all the requirements so far. However, if we don't detect an inconsistency, then we just continue. So this is uh, what's replacing the check of is this zero? We can't check for this being zero, but we can check for this being small. And uh, well, there's two questions. There was two questions in, in the original version as well, which was when it returns, why is it going to, when TensorPlan returns, why is it going to give you a good policy? Um, and then the second question is, does it ever stop? How, how many steps until it, it has to stop? So we have to revisit both of these questions again. For the first question, we're not going to spend too much time on that because uh, intuitively, so the question of like, why is the policy returned by, by this version of TensorFlow still good? Well, intuitively, you only allow a little slack of epsilon. And uh, it turns out you can bound the, the total amount of suboptimality that you introduce by this, uh, by this epsilon times h, you know, and, and, and whatever, uh, but, but as, a, as a function of epsilon. Um, and, and I think that's kind of boring. So let's, let's not, um, I mean, unless we want to, but, but, uh, I think the, the more interesting part is how many steps until it stops. Okay. Uh, Vlad? Yeah. So once we find this inconsistency, the search for a new theta that makes it consistent, including that, um, I guess that state, that's the, is that the, in the computational intractability yes. part? Yeah. That's the yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the that's the part where you have to take. Uh, it's going to look something like you know uh, org max theta uh, in in this ball L two ball of of like size b, which is going to be the yeah. And then and then you take this is that like the L two bound that we have, and you and you basically just uh, want to maximize the inner product of theta with phi of s zero, which is the starting state vector subject to um subject to the constraints that we have here right the constraints look like like this and the, and the, and the problem is with these constraints is i mean this looks linear but the issue is that it is linear in f of theta but not linear in 
theta itself. So f of theta, if you remember, is this inner product. So theta is inner product with themselves, a times, capital A times. And, and so, yeah, like the, the problem is that a, uh, like a um, requirement like this isn't linear in theta, but your argmax is, is in theta and, and it's, you know, it's like a linear, linear in theta, but not linear in F theta. So it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, I imagine this is a super non-convex kind of spiky thing, but uh, yeah. Maybe, sorry, that, maybe there is a solution, but uh, I'd, not that I know of, to yeah, do this that, computationally. Efficiently. And that data yes. up there, that was outer producted with itself n times, right? Not not inner product. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, did I say inner product of this? No, it's, yeah, yeah. it's like outer producted with itself, which is to say the same thing as yeah, tensor yeah. producted over a times. Yes. Yeah. Like sorry. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um. So. So that's, yeah, that's how we change TensorFan. Uh, and now the only question is how long uh, can such a sequence go? A sequence where we detect inconsistencies and add further requirements for our theta to satisfy. And, and actually what we can say about this sequence is um, provided that the sequence doesn't go longer than this ED um, steps uh, or square root ED, uh, we, we can say that the sum of Maybe there shouldn't be a square root, but I guess I was simplifying a couple of things. The, sl the slack will make sense later. Um, anyway, the, the sum of these, uh, the, the, the sum of the, the whenever, okay, so, so you, you go around this uh, loop, you find new thetas, and for each theta i, you find this, um, uh, you, have to, you have to have it such that the, the sum of the, absolute values, uh, these are the inconsistencies for the previous steps. Like you, you look at the, the previous Ds that you um, measured. And what you want is that the, the sum has to be less than equal to epsilon, right? Because for every single one of them, it's less than epsilon over the slack. And assuming that there's not more of them than the slack number, uh, you know, you have this requirement, um, but you also have the requirement that, uh, or, or you also find that then, you know, after you find this theta i, you find a new data tilde i such that this, uh, this inconsistency happens, right? Okay, so, so basically, as you keep finding inconsistencies, you keep finding new elements of a sequence um, such that, you know, that this theta i satisfies that the sum of inconsistencies before is less than epsilon, but this inconsistency now is greater than epsilon. So that's kind of a, a different way to say the same thing. And I'll make this a little bit more pre precise, but this is just to, to start talking about, you know, the same languages as what the eluder dimension kind of language will be like. Yes, Chaba? Just a small, uh, maybe a typo or something. So this, uh, it seems this is linear in theta, but it should be like f theta i, right? Like this f oh, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah like every every place here, it should just be f of theta i or theta j or whatever. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks, thanks. Um, okay, um, now to go on about uh, a new dimension, which is going to be yeah, as, as we told, yeah, this sequence will basically be kind of like an eluder sequence. Um, the sequence of, you know, detecting these inconsistencies and, and, and what that means. So let's talk about eluder dimension. And it, it comes from this paper, which uh, is a pretty good paper. It, it has all the nitty gritty details, but I, I guess I just want to sum up what, what this is. Um, oh, yeah. And, and one thing, eluder just kind of means like, you know, like a sequence that eludes, kind of escapes something. And, and this is going to make sense, but this is why uh, I believe it is lowercase. So it's not, it, it, is, it is just eluder dimension. And, and so what is this thing? Um, well, we, we write dim e and uh, dim e, what can have an eluder dimension? It, uh, the function class can have a dimension, right? That makes sense. So this is a class of functions that map from some x to r. And then it also has a scale parameter epsilon. And so 
the alluder dimension is the length tau of the longest alluder sequence. And what is an alluder sequence? Well, it is a sequence x1 to x tau from, from x, such that for some epsilon prime that is at least as large as epsilon, let's, let's, for, for now, let's not worry about this. For each L from one to tau, it is satisfied that um, this soup is greater than this epsilon prime, right? And so what is this soup? So for, for each L, that means, okay, so basically what we're doing here is we have x1, x2, x3, let's say L equals R, uh, L equals three. Uh, and, and what is satisfied is that the um, soup of, I guess some, some L's are missing. So the soup of, uh, as you take F1 and F2 from the function class, the, um, you, can, you can find two functions in the function class such that um, their values disagree. So the, the, the difference absolute value is larger than epsilon on XL, but they agree on all the previous ones. So like if I sum up uh, I equals one to L minus one, uh, the disagreements, which are disagreement squares. So like you have, you have the previous axes and I evaluate the function on all of the previous axes and I evaluate both functions and I look at the discrepancy and I square them and I add them up uh, and, and I take the square root, of course, outside, sorry about that. Uh, then this is gonna be bounded by epsilon prime, right? Okay, so what did I say again? Let me just, let me just show you a picture. What's happening here is you have these functions, you have the two black functions, you have a, a red function and a, and a blue function. Okay, so, um, I can, I can give you X one and tell like that its value is somewhere around this region up to some epsilon prime, right? And that, if, if I told you that, if, if this was, if this four functions were your function class, then that excluded this function, right? This, this is definitely not the function that can take a value close to here, right? So you only have three functions left. Um, but I can give you another point here where among the functions that you didn't exclude, you know, uh, I, I tell you that the value is around here. Among the functions that you didn't exclude, I showed you another X such that uh, I can tell where its value is and that's gonna exclude a further function. Like you weren't sure about its value, about the function's value around, here, uh, around the X, but I can tell you what it was and then you can further restrict your functions, right? And so can I continue this sequence? Well, I guess I can, I can continue, I can do one more and I can say X3, well, you're not sure about this function value, but I can tell you it's, it's this one. And now, only now do you know that it's definitely this, this red function that I'm talking about, right? And so the alluder dimension is the length of the sequence of X's such that I can tell you what the function's value is at X and you weren't sure about it up to this epsilon accuracy. You were like, I can tell you it's around here and you weren't sure about it up to this epsilon accuracy. So, so like, you know, how long until there is basically no more point, no more X where you're not at least epsilon sure about the accuracy of the function of that value. So that's, if, if we go back just, just for a second more, cause now, now maybe this makes more sense. So what, what is this for, for, you know, you, you have to have a sequence such that for any part of that sequence, like you chop off, you know, a, a, a beginning of this sequence, um, and then, and then you say, Chaba. Just finish and then I will ask a question. Yeah, and then, okay, cool. And then, and then what you say is what you require is that there be two members of the function class such that if you add up the sum squared uh, difference, uh, the, the, the sum squared um, discrepancies of the x's so far, the values that the functions take at the axis so far, then that is going to be small. And yet on this new value, the uh, discrepancy is large. And so how long can you, can you do this? That's exactly the same as saying, how long can I give you X's such that you're not yet sure about the function value there, but I tell you what the function value is and be continuing. Can I give you one more? You know, so that's, that's kind of the, the, 
uh, a looter dimension. Yep. Yeah, my question was uh, on the figure below. Mm -hmm. To understand the definition, it's useful to know, like, okay, you define a leader sequence. So, what is an a leader sequence? You claim that this is an a leader sequence, uh, mm -hmm. and and we kind of went through why this is an a leader sequence. Can you show us a non a leader sequence? Yes, yes. So let's say, and this is a very good question because what if I started with x three? Like, what if this was my x one? here and then like i didn't plot this but all the four functions take different values like while the different values at x1 if i start with x1 i cannot continue with any x2 so like if i make this my x2 then it is no longer true that if i tell you the value at this x1 that you can't figure out the value at this x2 because you know whatever the value is it's going to uniquely determine uh the function that i talk about and 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 that's going to uniquely determine the value at x Two. So that that shows you how, and that is not an eluder sequence, right? If I if I went in this order, so that shows you how there is a sequential element of it. Like the 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 order in which you get the things does matter, and it's it's going to be the worst case order. Like how how like if if they give you if they feed you data and they, they want to make it hard for you. In what order can they feed you data such that the data is still somewhat useful? Like you didn't know exactly what the value would have been for that for that x, but um, you know, but 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 you yeah, like how, how long can you can you go like this? In the worst case, if you don't choose your x's, uh, does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Uh, maybe, maybe people can think about like if you started with the x one as on the figure. Uh, what would be an x2, which is acceptable according to the definition, but which is maybe the least helpful or something. Although in, in this case, maybe uh, there is a, yeah, it's like for this figure, is three the max? Uh, I don't know what the epsilon level is, but like if we, yeah, I think people can think about this on their own, given the figure. It's, it's yeah, excellent. Yeah. yeah. And I guess I guess you can imagine that whenever I plot, like there, there could also be like another red line that goes very close to this red line. So we're not just talking about a looter dimension is always equal to the function class size, obviously, right? Because there, if there was another red that was very close to this red, then that wouldn't have changed the, the looter dimension. That's just an aside, but yeah, okay. So um, the, the statement, the claim here is that um, the looter dimension is going to be uh, scaling roughly like D, right? And then there's some log factors hidden and what goes on, uh, these like obviously the, okay, I didn't say this, but if F, this function class is a linear class that takes, that maps an X to an inner product of X and theta for a theta that is bounded by B in L2 norm, this is like tensor plans B, and for an X that is, is bounded by L in L2 norm and, and both live in a d-dimensional uh, space, then you have this like, you, you know, you, you kind of uh, scale with D, but there is a log factor of B times L over epsilon. Epsilon is your, your eluder scale, right? So that's, that's kind of the statement. And, and this is great because it, it means it kind of behaves very similarly to like, you can imagine in, in the limit uh, when epsilon is, is zero, right? Like this becomes kind of like linear algebra because what you have is, you know, you know exactly what the functions are at these values. Can you then determine what the next, what the function values are everywhere? And, and because, you know, you're, your witnesses, your like new X's are such that they don't always agree. That means you like, it always reduces your dimensionality of, of possible uh, thetas by one. So that's the argument we had in the last lecture. That's just a purely linear algebra kind of argument. You can think of it as orthogonality or like how many, you know, new lines of equations do you have to see to be able to solve the linear system if all of them tell you something new. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, the no noise version. And then this epsilon brings in the, the noise, like measurement noise kind of version. And it tells you that the answer, the, the dimensionality, the length of the longest sequence is still scaling with the, it just, you know, has some logarithmic factors.
Okay. Okay, and uh, yeah, so I, I will talk a little bit about the proof, but not, not too much because I want to make some connections with other things. But do interrupt me if I go over something a bit too quickly and it doesn't make sense. Uh, it, it may not even make sense to me and then we figure it out together. Yes? Yeah, just one quick, so about the alluded dimension, like that set X from which we get our um, X1, X2, whatever from, yep. does that need to be discrete, I guess? Like if it's continuous, can't we just have like an, in? like how do we, can't we just have like an infinite sequence of some small it, interval it, for which it, this it, will always hold? It It is continuous, but um, but in this case it has to be, Bounded, so this is like an an L two ball, right? So okay, um, so why can't this be an infinitely long sequence? Um, it, it's because at every step you find out about like some inner product, um, and you find it out up to some epsilon accuracy, such that you weren't sure about this. So you you can't give like zeros here because you know for the zero you, have, you know every, everything agrees on the zero. You know, um, so you have to give values where some of the things disagree with each other, some of the functions disagree with each other, and and then every single step you get a new value. You exclude some of some of this functions from from the function class. So the function class is shrinking, and so um, it's it's enough to, for if if f is a finite function class, then uh, you can already see that the leader dimension can be at most as large as the cardinality of f, regardless of whether x is discrete or not. But but maybe there is something special about linear linear kind of functions and uh, function classes, and and there is so so that you know it goes further than that. It's obviously not like everything in f because here we're considering an infinitely large uh, function class as well. So there is. Kind of something more here and it yeah it is it is going to be actually quite small i don't know if that answers your question like you might have had a concern in mind about how to create an infinitely long sequence yeah yeah i think i would just i should just think about this a little more on my own but yeah thanks <laughs> yeah how about the 2d case when d equals two then you can throw everything should I start drawing something here? So I don't see. know. I guess, yeah. Uh, I don't know how useful this is going to be. So if, if d is 2, then maybe your theta lives in here, and so does your x, just to make things simpler. And then you observe some inner products, like maybe this is your theta, and then you observe some inner products. Uh, I don't know if this doodling is going to be helpful, but every single time you observe I don't know. I, I don't think this is the. I guess, yeah, I guess it's just that every single time you observe something, you exclude your function class and the, uh, exclude some elements from the function class. And can you do it in such a way that you don't exclude like a big proportion of them every single time? Uh, but, but yeah, I, I don't know if I can come up with a useful figure right now. Um, but but I guess I guess maybe with the proof sketch, uh, things will make sense. Maybe, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, for this, we introduce this VI, which is going to be a matrix, and it's going to have some lambda times the identity matrix plus the sum of XI outer producted with itself uh, matrices. Okay, where where the x i are, you know, these points in the sequence. Uh, okay, and and you set your lambda to be epsilon squared over b squared. It's not very important, but you set your lambda to be small, such that the lambda times the theta l two is bounded by this epsilon squared. Okay, and and what you can prove now is that if there exists a new leader sequence element x i plus one. And that means that the x i plus one's norm, according to this b i uh, inverse, is large. Okay, so this is kind of this is I, I skipped over a lot of things here, um, but but here what I'm what I'm kind of saying is let me pick a new color. 
is that if you if you write this, um, you know the the the. So so what you had is like this sum squared thing was less than epsilon, right? And and this was a requirement for x i plus one to satisfy. And so this can be turned, this, this squared here is, is gonna be like squaring um, the, what, what you, okay, so what you're, let me, let me go back here. What you're squaring obviously is like the differences of the F1, F2s on Xi. And, and this is going to be similar to taking X with your newest theta squared which you know these should be close to zero. Um, anyway, so taking taking the, uh, the 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 sum squared is is kind of similar to you saying that you take x uh, x i's norm in, uh, in in v because what this does in v i minus one. Yeah, because what this does is it has this element in it, and then and then that this element, if you if you uh, take the, the norm with x i, then that's going to have a similar form to this. Okay, I I don't know if this makes sense, but basically, yeah, it's because this is like this. You know, if you sorry, this should be a theta here. Sorry, theta. So theta's norm in v i minus one. If if you imagine like if I if I multiply this by Theta, theta transpose, that's kind of like the sum of squ sum squared of this. And then since I don't have the squared here, then that, that accounts for the square root, and that's going to be smaller than epsilon. Okay, so I have this condition that the uh, theta's norm in vi minus one is, is less than epsilon, kind of. There is an effect from this, but that's that's small because we chose lambda to be small. Anyway, so we have this requirement and subjected this requirement. Um, to find a new element such that uh, it has a large uh, dis discrepancy with something is is uh, kind of like saying this and and I guess I guess I don't want to super go into why but you can kind of massage the terms um, and and what you will find is is that yeah is, is that this is kind of what has to be satisfied. Uh, for a new leader, a leader element to exist. And then I guess I just wanted to take the proof from here. Um, and then maybe later, if we have time, we can go a little bit more into it, into, into why this holds, but there is a bunch of calculations here. Um, but but yet, yeah, once you prove this, what you then ask is like, how long can, can you find Xs such that the new Xis, Xi plus ones, uh, norm in vi inverse is large. How long can you keep doing this? Because as you keep doing this, your vi grows as well, right? Like you always keep adding this xi, xi transpose to it. Um, and, and so if you imagine this matrix and how it's gonna look, it's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. And by that, I mean, if you think about its eigenvalues, it is going to keep increasing, right? Because you, you keep adding these, these things. Um, and, and then you take the, the norm uh, accor according to the inverse of it, which is going to then decrease, right? Because the inverse is eigenvalues decrease. So, um, and, and you always find a new element such that this norm is still large. So how, how long can you keep doing this? Uh, and, and so that here's, here's the second part of this proof, which is, this, uh, it just talks about how like the determinant of the VI is well, you can express it as a product of, of the VI minus one matrix and whatever you need to product it with, get VI, and then take the determinant of the first one and then the determinant of the second one ends up just being this for the identity and then this for whatever you had to product it with to get VI. And this is conveniently exactly this norm that, that, we, that we were talking about. Um, and then, and then that's going to be, yeah. The, the, then you can bound this uh, and say that the v zero, the debt v zero is just lambda to the d because you initialized v zero to be lambda i. 
And, and then the rest of them, uh, you know, because of this condition, because it's an eluder sequence, and these have to be three over two. So if you can continue this for I steps, then, then the determinant will have to be at least this big, right? Which is kind of to say that the eigenvalues grow because the, the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. And, and this, is, this is going to be huge, right? Like it, it grows exponentially. But then also what you, what you have is that uh, the, like how quickly can this determinant grow? It can't grow, you know, that quickly for, for very long because um, you, you can bound the determinant by the trace over D to the D. And this is just uh, arithmetic geometric means because this is the, the product of eigenvalues and this is the sum of eigenvalues. And then you, you, you just basically use AMGM and then you can further bound this by saying like the trace of VI, you know, what is VI? Well, VI is this thing, right? So the trace of VI is going to be the trace of this, which is lambda D plus, uh, you know, this, these things are the L2 norms of this are bounded by L. So then you can bound this term with like I times that you added this L squared, right? So, so what do we have here? We have a determinant upper bound and we have a determinant lower bound. So this can only go as long as, as, as this manages to be bigger or equal to this. But this doesn't grow as quickly as this, right? This grows exponentially in I and this doesn't. So that's kind of where the proof finishes because you know you can compute what is the biggest i for which this is is uh, greater or equal to this? And it turns out it's logarithmic in L and and uh, and and what else did we have here? We had um, B and epsilon, but uh, but the um, the the D it's going to be linear in D, right? Okay, so like the epsilon and the B come from the lambda component. If you were wondering. So that's, that's, you know, that is as long as you can continue because, you know, beyond that, you would have a contradiction with the debt being smaller than something that it has to be larger than. So that's, that's kind of the proof uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Uh, there is a longer version from, from the previous year's lecture uh, if this left you somewhat confused or we might have time at the end, but... Uh, but yeah, also questions. Any questions? Shall we? Sorry, I, I might have mispronounced your name here. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, I'm just wondering why we are requiring the uh, the weighted norm of xi plus one to be greater than a half. Oh, we're not requiring this. This is something that uh, I, I didn't, I, I tried to, uh, this, this, I, Imagine didn't make a lot of sense, but but uh, what we are saying is that if there is a new element, a looter element, then that implies that this norm is large. So that's that's kind of how we get a handle on on how how many times we can do this, because every time this happens, this norm will be large, and and that is a part of the proof that I, I very uh, quickly glossed over. So uh, yeah, that, yeah, but I I tried explaining a little bit here, but. Um, but I guess, I guess last year's lecture explains better um, why this is true. But we're not requiring this. We're just proving that this must hold. And then because this must hold, you know, then we can bound the number of times this can hold. And, and it, is, it, it simply comes, yeah, it comes from like this being an eluder element means that it, uh, at this X, you have a lot of uncertainty. You know, even if you've seen all the data that you've seen in the eluder sequence so far, you still have a lot of uncertainty about the value at this X. Uh, and so that is kind of this, what this quantity is trying to express. In fact, if you have a linear system where like you, you observe some, some linear equations, like, you know, you, you have a secret theta and you observe that the inner product of this theta with some X is roughly this value and roughly that value, you know, then, if you do, if, if you just imagine like least squares, what, what kind of error bounds do you get from these squares? 
then you will get exactly these kind of error. This is this is the uncertainty you have in at, at a at a point x i plus one. If you've seen data on these axes so far, which gives you this this v i. So that is the the uncertainty that, that you had, um, and and yeah. So that's that's like this this comes up a lot because this this bounds how many new uh, data points you can observe where you weren't sure, but now you're going to be sure and you know, keep going, which is kind of the eluder sequence. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So I guess that explains why we can have an infinite infinite long sequence, right? Because vi is increased, vi inverse. It's increasing, I guess. Oh yeah. Uh, so vi, vi, okay. So um, if if I maybe I can draw something here. Uh, so vi, um, you can you can kind of imagine this thing as a as like an ellipsoid, right? Like, so you added. Oh, this is a really stupid looking ellipsoid. But let's say you you added this uh, vector and you added this vector. And then that's going to give you, um, you know, this kind of confidence region. And this, this in this ellipsoid, uh, this is the places where x, x is v inverse uh, norm is less is less squared is less than some epsilon, right? Um, and and so if you now. Seeing an eluder sequence point kind of means that you that you see another x, which where you're not where you're not sure, right? Like you you see another x, and like it's outside of your confidence ellipsoid defined by this v. When this happens, you you add it to the v, like you add this x x transpose to the v, right? And your new v, your new ellipsoid is going to be larger. Now I don't know if I can draw this, but it's it. Uh, it will just be larger, right? Like it might be like, ooh, I don't know, big. And then it keeps growing. And then the, 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 the confidence region where you're confident about the axis va values will grow. And eventually, um, you know, your entire set of axes where, that you care about, I'm gonna zoom out a lot here. The entire set of axes is this, this uh, ball, this ball of, of radius, did we say L? We said L, right? So when this confidence region becomes so big, this ellipsoid becomes so big that it um, contains this ball, then you're done. That, that you could you couldn't see anything else. So then the the only question is how quickly does this grow, and does it does it in fact you know grow within d times log uh, steps to be to, to contain this this uh, ball? Cool. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, and and to, to okay, and and I guess I guess since we were talking about the like these uncertainties that that you get um, in in kind of these linear systems where you observe these x x in a product with theta values approximately, um, this yeah. So this is going to be your your like confident like your uncertainty in the new axis prediction. And oftentimes what you have is, is an algorithm where um, the regret of the algorithm can be bounded by the total sum of uncertainties on the points that it has seen, right? Um, and so this kind of stuff comes up and, and there is the Bandit's book, which you might've heard about, uh, in that this is called the elliptical potential lemma and in, and in lots of other places, but, but I just screenshotted the lemma from there. And, and so this is a similar kind of thing. Um, so what you have is here you have like a, a is your sequence. So the notation is going to be a little bit different. Um, but you have the same kind of L bounded norm on, on uh, to norm on, on A. Um, and then you have the same kind of V. Then what you have is that the sum so this is this is the uncertainty term that we were talking about, the sum of the minimum of one and that, uh, as as you go from one to n data points, is upper bounded by by this, which is further upper bounded by this. And this is a, you might recognize that the shape of this is very very similar to what we had before, but what this is doing is is this uh, you know you can use this sum 
kind of argument, this elliptical potential lemma to say, to, to ban the regret of an algorithm that, that will make that will make errors uh, scaling with this uncertainty. And yeah, this, this last bit is just, you, you can say it's kind of this because, you know, because of the, the different bounds that we had. So yeah, um, it's just a different form of it, but you know, it's, it's uh, th this, this form of it is actually uh, quite well known as well. So it's perhaps useful to include this. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit, a little bit about like uh, connection to like different ways of defining dimensions and, and like whether there is a connection between them. But before we go there, and this is just a, an extension. So I, I guess, I guess before that, uh, if there are any more questions about this or, or anything before, uh, yes, anybody? Okay, uh, if, if not, then I'll, I'll just go on. Um, th there's this paper, which is actually a very short paper and I, I encourage you to read it because it's super interesting. It's, it's uh, I love how concise it is. Um, it, it defines the eluder dimension a little bit differently, but the, I guess the only difference is like, it doesn't have this epsilon prime greater than epsilon kind of business, which we didn't really need anyway. Um, so let's not worry about that. It's just it's it's basically just the eluder dimension, um, and then and then it has another thing called estim star dimension, which is like eluder dimension but not sequential. So so um, you know this thing where we said like the sum of discrepancies so far has to be less than epsilon. Instead, we don't say sum of the discrepancies so far. Like we don't sum with j less than i, but we sum with j not equal to i so we, we kind of sum the discrepancies in the future as well if that makes sense in fact there is no future and there is no past because it isn't it's it's the non-sequential version um so so yeah uh that, that's just a slightly different uh way to to like if you if you need this quantity but you're not in a sequential problem then, then you can use star dimension okay so so far uh there's nothing new um but then there's the, this generalized strength, this, um, let's say you have some activation function sigma, right? So then it defines the sigma rank. Um, and, and this, this is, you can think of it as kind of a, a version of dimension, right? So what does this mean? You have a function class F, which ma maps as before from X to R, and there is a scale. Right, and so the sigma rank is the smallest dimension D for which you can create feature mappings and you create feature mappings phi and, 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 uh, and W or omega or whatever this is, uh, such, that, um, the, such that what you have is that for all of the X and F, so X is like coming from your, your space that, that your function acts on. And F is an element of the feature uh, function class. So for any member of it, you can express the function's value at X as uh, just the sigma of the inner product of these two D dimensional quantities. So what this means is what is the dimension that you need to be able to embed both your function class and your X space in this, you know, d-dimensional space, such that you can you can express the the function's value uh, with this inner product, but you know you also have the activation. So you apply the activation on the inner product, and you can express the function this way. So this is this is kind of interesting, right? Because it it uh, flips around the question. It's not asking you know how how many elements, how long is the sequence of of um, d-dimensional, you know, in, a, in this d-dimensional linear space, how long can you have this sequence that you still, you know, you, you're not sure, and then you observe something, and then you're still not sure. Um, instead, it asks, like, what is the dimensionality required to express a function class and its values on, on, on this x uh, in this linear kind of way with an activation function? Yes, Chaba? So there is a scale as well here, but oh, it, it yes. seems very different. 
Yeah, the scale is very different. The scale is more, so that's only used here. And it's more like what we had in this, we used to call this capital B, which is the L2 norm of theta. Oh yeah, so like if, yeah, like you can just think of if sigma was uh, the identity function, then this is kind of like what we had where the function could be expressed as theta. And then you had the phi, which was just phi. Right. And then, and then that, that's going to give you back the, the thing that we had before. And then the rank would be the, the number D that is required to, to express these functions in this linear space. And so the assumption that we had with TensorPen is that like D is enough. And in fact, you have the features, right? And here the question is like, what is the smallest that you need? Um, Okay, and then and then uh, a couple of things, examples of this. Uh, RK is just going to be identity RK, so that's just sigma rank with sigma being the identity function, and M index um, uh, mu is going to be. Uh, it, so okay, this is this is simplified because. Um, let, let's just say we, we call it for, for like in the case of sigma being differentiable, this means that uh, the, the uh, derivative is bounded. Um, but but, but if, if it's not differentiable, there is like a, a little bit longer version of expressing what this means. But yeah, it basically means it's got bounded derivatives. And then the RK was the identity. And then, and then what this paper, okay, so what this paper is all about is like finding relationships between the ranks, which are this like dimensionality required for, for different sigmas to express a, a function class and, uh, and you know, the alluder or the star dimension. So, okay. The arrows here mean that, uh, yes, Chimok? Just before that, this differentiability, uh, is there a typo here? So you want to say that sigma prime is Upper bounded, let's say, in oh, absolute oh, value oh, by oh, mu. Oh, oh, sorry, big, big mistake. Uh, less than equal one. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, uh, okay. It turns so out, it's like okay. that. There needs to be a certain growth or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it turns out ha having to. So this okay. being zero is is kind of uh, wait harder or easier. Let me think. Okay. So the arrow means that um, that this you can't do anything. Well, okay, so so the arrow means that the dimensionality here is less than the dimensionality here, right? Does it mean that? Greater than, less than, less than. Wait, hold on, I'm I'm confused. Does 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 it mean that this thing is greater than this thing? How about the rank? Just the rank. Yeah, yeah, like. Uh, Okay, I got super confused here. Um, An entry f in m1, m2 means that m1, f is more than equal to. Great, okay, okay, okay. So so I, I think that is what I thought it is, isn't it? So that, that the uh -huh. m1, okay, so that, that would mean that the m0, um, rank would be smaller than the M, uh, than, than like if you have a larger, so like if you have a larger, if, if the derivative is bounded away from zero, then that means you might need a lot more dimensions to express the function class. Yes? That is the expressibility. Okay, this makes sense now, right? Because one includes the other, right? So the, uh, the only, thing that might be surprising is not only does it include the other, but there is like, it, it makes it, uh, there's like a, a huge difference between the two. The, the difference between the, the rank could, could be huge. So that's, uh, you know, if you allow this to be zero, then you, your dimensionality required, that is your rank might be a lot lower than if you disallow it and you say it's going to be Bounded away from zero. I see. It's like uh, you, you kind of left that out, but you're defining these ranks for a collection of these transfer functions sigma, 
and then you can have a bigger, oh, bigger yes. class of transfer functions or a smaller one. And if, yes. if we set mu to be uh, zero, then we get the largest one. And if you get the largest, we are taking a mean over those. So it's like the best possible transfer function that you use. And because of yes. that, now everything makes sense. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, so okay. I, I guess I forgot to talk about this part, but it, it yeah, it just basically says right. that um, for for a class of functions, you, you take the smallest rank in, in that, yeah, as you said. Okay, so I guess what's interesting here is is like, okay, this isn't too surprising. Well, everything is kind of surprising because it doesn't mean, so like, SDIM is obviously going to be at most as large as EDIM because it's a, it's a harder requirement. But, but the arrow means that there is a, a big difference. There's a function class for which there is a big difference. Um, and, and okay, so, so like you have this relationship and then you have this and then this and this. Okay, but what you don't have is the arrows in between these. So uh, that already tells you something. It's quite a complicated story. But I think what's, what's interesting is, is this, on this right-hand side, it gives you the, the table of, of like what function class is uh, can you prove the relevant results with? So, for example, this this here is the function class that multiplies some of its inputs. So, like you you have an x inputted to to a function class, and it will multiply some of the indices. So like x is a vector, and it will maybe multiply the first and the third and the fourth index in it, and um, the looter dimension. That is to say that the number of steps you need to observe to find what function we were talking about is uh, is actually for this class. Let me just say this right. It is a lot less pure than than if you had um, than if you had like this rank. So the rank can be a lot larger than that. I hope I said it right. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, that that is the witness for it, and then there's different witnesses for different kind of of problems and, and their relationships. And I th I think it's kind of interesting to to see these and to to maybe even look through the proofs because the whole paper is like seven or eight pages, something like that, uh, and it gives you a, a bunch of different kinds of functions, and you know all of these all of these different things here are kind of measure complexity of function classes right but they they can be wildly different like exponentially different between between them and um and yeah it's just interesting interesting to think about like what kind of functions are easy in one way but hard in another way to to uh to represent so yeah i, I don't know if there's anything else uh yeah these are threshold functions these are ReLU functions ReLU activate uh, that is like zero at the negative, and then it becomes like um, it just it just has a slope in the positive section, and then this is some exponential where it's like exponential between zero and one, and then it, it get, gets like clipped linearly uh, beyond it. So anyway, it's it's kind of a fun paper, um, but I, I guess the the big takeaway is like you have a lot of different complexity measures, and uh, it, the the relationships are somewhat chaotic between them. And uh, just pick the one that you you need, because if it's not exactly like a lunar dimension, but it's something else, then you might be able to find different uh, bounds, and you know, or you might be able to find that one has no hope of bounding the other, or maybe it does. Anyway, so that's uh, that's I think all I wanted to say. Uh, and then, and then there were some questions from Slack. We can go there, or if, if there's any questions from here, then maybe those come first, and then and then Slack questions. I do have a quick question here, uh, with yes. Rayu. Uh, how big is the difference between I don't know the M zero rank? It seems. And the LED dimension, there is the F value there. Maybe that's an interesting case. 
uh, uh, M0 rank, maybe we can think about like what's the M0 rank of the Ryu function. I think it's D, right? Because it's like you can trivially yes. and yes. things. Uh, and then for the LU, the dimension, maybe we can think about like, okay, how big is the LU dimension for a Ryu class? That could be pretty. Well, how big is that? It depends on how you define this Ryu class, I guess. If there is no bias, then it should be D. If there is bias, then, well, it's going to depend on the epsilon, but it's going to be, I don't know, one over epsilon to the power of D or something, I think. I do wonder, though, if. Um... Okay, I, I, I am again a little bit confused, but but uh, if I'm reading this, the, the thing that shows the distinction between M0 and EDIM is this is this multiplication function, isn't it? That where you multiply some of the indices. Oh, the okay, so what, what are the rows and the columns of this table? Like, because right. that is another, the, the, <laughs> the diagonal, oh, the opposite oh, one. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh, also, I, I see. Okay, also so there. Because that, that's because you have you don't have an arrow in either direction, and that's why. So to not, oh, have, yeah. an, you go. To not have an arrow between either direction, you have to show that and, either of them can be okay. much larger than the other. Okay. And so... It's, an arrow means like one is necessarily much larger than, or at least, you know, as large, um, but having no arrow between the two means like, yeah, okay, so there's two different, okay. So uh, I would think the Ryu class is here, the Ryu class with biases. Can we, do you um, know that? Let me, let me just check real quick, but uh, yeah. yeah, you, because I wonder if, if you, if you couldn't just observe, yeah, there is, there is a, uh, so like, F A B A is the linear part and B is the bias such that A squared plus B squared is okay. bounded by Okay, okay. One. That is a bias. There then, is a bias. Then then the other dimension is gonna be if one over epsilon part to the power of D or something. One over epsilon to the power of D? Yeah, it's like you, you can hide uh, like you have the ball. Yeah. And then you can pick a direction and you can pick like to what degree you want to like the, the Ryu function without the bias, it would use half space and then linearly increasing on one of the half space, uh, one, one, one half space and zero on the other one, right? And if you have a bias, mm -hmm. then you can shift this thing uh, out of the center of the ball. And if you shift it for quite a bit, then you can add you for a long time because now you have this very small caps of the sphere. Right, right. And all so... these functions are different. Oops. Um, yeah, so I guess what we have is you have this, this thing, but what I'm going to tell you is like, oh, like if you manage to get within this, oh, no, <sighs> within this part, if you manage to get within this part, then you hit the linear region. But if you don't, you don't hit the linear region. And the, and this is going to be because I use the bias to, to offset the half That's space. Right. Yeah. And then, and then the probability that you end up in this is tiny. Like you can, you know, uh, because of that, like I can give you a lot of different, um, right. possibilities yeah. that, yeah. that would have had the same kind of, uh, intersection of, of zero space and you've only observed the zero space so like i can give you keep giving you points and yeah. uh if you yeah if you keep restricting the function class it's still gonna be big so the editor That's... sequence would be like points on the surface of the sphere such that for any two subsequent of those points somehow these caps that you were shading with blue do not intersect Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can construct many of these. That that's gonna be an alluder sequence, mm -hmm. right? 
and uh, and then you can you can make that pretty long, uh, depending on how small your epsilon is. If if you have a small epsilon, then then that decreases the volume of the yeah. cap, and uh, no, you can make that uh, very long. So that, that's why. Okay, so that's why uh, the Aluder dimension is going to be exponential. Yep. For the ratio, and then the M zero rank dimension. So that's just D for this case. It doesn't matter how small the cap is, right? Mm -hmm. D plus yes, one yes. or something. Yes. Uh, because of the way things are defined, just by definition, this ratio is has this product structure that you have just like the function dependent parts, which is A and B, like the bias and, and this direction. So they just determine mm -hmm. the function and then the point just determine yeah. this other part. And then and then the other way around you can you can think of the uh, yeah, it's so... like to, to to represent a multiplication of indices of the input is actually super hard Hmm. Is this you, product? Yes. But if you think of the alluder sequence, then what you need to find out is, is well, which indices have been producted. So, yeah. so like, you know, every, every time you observe something and, and you, you know, maybe you can, yeah, it kind of makes sense that you can shrink your, your set of functions that are still compatible at an exponential rate. Yeah, it's a factor of two or something. I think. Yes. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, it has to it has to say that some permutations don't work, or not permutations, some, some choices don't work. You know. Yeah. OK. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, cool. Super cool paper. It's a, it's a good one. OK. Um, Slack questions? Yeah, remaining four minutes. That's oh, good. God, four minutes? I thought we had 14. It's fine. OK, OK, sorry about this. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, OK. So Homayun, I, I might have mispronounced your name again. Uh, but uh, do you want to read out your question? And uh, we'll, we'll get through you yes, real quick. Or maybe. Maybe I should read it out because, like, I don't know if they're on the call right now. Is he on? Maybe not. Uh, yeah, I don't think he's here. Okay. 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 So the question was for Q star and V star realizable features that exists a parameter vector that can produce Q star or V star using dot product with the features. Is it possible to come up with Q star or V star realizable features without having to solve? for and find the optimal action value function first. And um, yes, I mean, I mean, the whole point would be that, right? If you could, if you already found the optimal action value function or value function, then you wouldn't really need to use any more than one dimension, right? Like you can say that you, you just basically give the, the action value function, right? Um, but yeah, like the idea is that you observe a state and an action and you can kind of parametrize what's happening in such a way that the whole MVP kind of boils down to knowing these parameters. And um, to give examples, well, from like the more theoretical side, uh, if you had your transition function be a linear kind of, um, if you, okay, so if, you, if you're in linear MVP land, then uh, which means like both your transitions and your rewards are linear, then um, in, in some features, then it turns out that in those features, that, that, that the Q star and the V star are also uh, linear. In fact, all Q pi and V pi. So let's say if you had like, uh, that, that's just one thing to say, but like there are some stronger things that imply this, um, some stronger MVP assumptions. But to give you a more real life example of how you could find the features without finding the optimal action value functions first, um, I think chess is a good example of how like you could have uh, a game where, you know, like maybe I don't know how to play optimally, but I do know that what tends to matter is, well, one thing in, 
a good heuristic is, is to look at like the values of the pieces on the board. So I can give you a feature vector that has like, you know, do I have, uh, do I have a, you know, like a, this or that, uh, and how many of, of these, like how many pawns do I have, uh, and so on and so forth. And then I can give you that as a feature vector. And like, you have to figure out, you know, um, the theta, which is like, what are the values of each? Like maybe the pawn is worth one and then, you know, you figure it out and then maybe you can, you can play the game. But obviously this isn't enough to play the game. So maybe I'll include in the feature vector stuff like, you know, is item one close to item B? Is, is item one threatening item B? And then you just have to learn like the weights that you associate with all of these. And, and I can blow up this feature space to have like pairwise things, maybe like triplets of things. And eventually, eventually like there's a, there's a paper that claims that eventually this will be for a limited number of D, this you'll be able to come up with a theta that will uh, be close to, to a, a good, you know, agent playing chess. So that's, that's kind of a, a real life example. But which I guess paper, the, the which paper is this? Oh God, uh, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but but maybe you do, Chapa, because I think we were looking at this a while back. Okay, yeah, give me some clue. Ooh, it was it was like half a year ago when I was over. <laughs> okay. I, I don't have any clues. Maybe okay, I, should, maybe I, I, should... I search, but I yeah, forgot. maybe I should also search offline. Uh, I I definitely won't be able to come up with anything on the spot. <laughs> That, uh, I, I, I do remember an Ottery 2600 uh, Marlos with mm -hmm. Michael Boring were running experiments, uh, but that was kind of like an experimental validation of these ideas that linear features are sufficient to play all these video games to the same degree as people were able to play them at the time with neural networks, and they were able to do it. Um, okay. So I hope I wasn't misremembering it, but let's just go with uh, with the Atari example, uh, just because I'm not 100% sure that I okay I know where uh, okay where to dig this up from. Okay, so um yeah, and then and then there's another thing that I want to say, but I'll come back I think with another question that that will be relevant here. Uh, but I think for now let's let's move on to the second question. Gabor, do you want to read this? Yeah, maybe I'll just sum it up. So. Basically, yeah. I was just yeah. wondering that there was this paper posted in Lecture Note 8 where uh, this exponential realm came up. And then also in TensorFlow, we have uh, uh, the, it's exponential in the number of uh, actions the query is, but it's polynomially in DH uh, to the power of A. So I was just wondering if, the, if this exponential part is inherent to linear function approximation or there's any hope to avoid it and then if not then how could we reason about stronger representations because this expression came up in the paper as well yes uh it's a, it's a very hard question <laughs> but uh but i think one thing to a couple of things to note is like you could have if you have for all pi uh q pi is linear if you have this kind of thing then you can have a, a positive result. Uh, I think that was like maybe lecture 10 where it was like, maybe that was a misspecification epsilon and that allowed you to do an epsilon times square root D optimal policy, right? So this is a linear uh, representation, but uh, crucially it, it says every policy has to be linear, which is kind of a, a super strong assumption, right? And then came this assumption of, you know, what if only Q star is linear? Um, and, and then it, see, it seems to be the case that like it's super hard. And yes, this, as you point out, there's uh, there's like a bunch of cases where you um, where you have a good function, a linear representation, but it's still like exponentially hard to to use it. And uh, and and I guess the the question is where do you go from here? Um, what is maybe in between these two? You know, maybe maybe this is a strong assumption and this is like too weak. So what's in between the two? Um, and there's a bunch of things that, that people have tried. So one is to have a minimum gap assumption that I think I was talking about like two lectures ago. Like if you have the Q star assumption and you also assume that there is an, a gap of optimal, suboptimal uh, actions everywhere uh, and you have your, you're in the planning regime, then you can uh, solve this in, in, in polynomial time. 
So like there are plenty of examples for both like impossible and impossible. Um, and uh, yeah, like the question of where to go from here is, is, is kind of always pretty hard. Um, it's just it's just about carving out that like landscape of you know what is what is tractable and what isn't um to talk about like non-linear stuff um i mean i think uh i i see how that that like improves or could Im could improve the expressibility of of things um but i guess i guess i don't know how much it would fundamentally, I mean, I, I don't know much, but but I guess I guess just to give an intuition of what this Q star uh, result means is that, you know, like linear is easy to learn, right? Like linear representations are easy to learn, but still, if only Q star is linearly uh, realizable, that is hard. And it is hard because you don't observe what Q star is, right? Like you, you have a stage in action and you don't observe the Q star for it, so you can't really learn. The only way you would observe Q star is if you knew how to act optimally from a state in an action, right? So what this kind of negative result tells you is that even if you had this like super nice, easy to learn function class, which is the linear function class, even then, um, and even if you could teleport everywhere and use a planner and like, you don't have to solve the exploration problem of how do you get to your place, even then, you, you're kind of lost because it's a chicken and egg problem of knowing how to act optimally to observe your target for the feature that you want to learn about, which which you can't. And so that it's it's kind of a, um, I, I guess I guess what it what it's pointing to is that this setting is is super hard. It's super hard because RL is hard because you have to keep making sequential decisions that have to be sequentially. You know, each of them has to be good for you to be able to even learn further. Uh, in this case and and that's you know and as opposed to something like bandits where you just you know you, you take one action and you observe something but uh you don't have to keep taking good actions to to uh to for that observation to have value so it's just to point out that rl is super hard and it is because of the sequentialness of it that that this q star being representable linearly doesn't kind of take out the difficulty of the problem which is interesting. And, and then, yeah, like, how do we go from here? Good question. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it's, there's always kind of settings where you, that you can find in between two settings where you know one is possible, the other is impossible, and then see if, if, if you can say something about it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. I hope that made some sense. Uh, and then, and then we have the last question. Yulin, do you want to uh, ask your question? Uh, yes. Uh, well, my question is that when we are actually implementing the offline planner, is it worthwhile that we to spend more efforts in the preparation step, uh, like working out a better feature map, such as choosing an optimal setting of the feature ve uh, vector dimension D, uh, or bounding the D? Um, because I noticed that the size of D has great influence on the computational cost or query cost. So, um, and if so, are there any nice developed methodologies uh, or research work regarding this topic? Uh, yes. Okay. So a couple of things to note here is 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 one that there um, there is this idea that as you say, like D being large is kind of a problem. So like um, some research looks into what you can say if, you know, like maybe, maybe you can gather a lot of features, but maybe only some of them matter. Like if you if you think you have a huge feature uh, vector, this is huge, like D is big, but theta is kind of such that like it's sparse, you know, there's only these like these values that matter, everything else doesn't matter. Like basically to say that like these are all zero, and then this is a question mark, this is a question, you know, if most of the entries are zero, uh, that is to say, like, maybe you only have S values that aren't zero, S sparse is what we call this, uh, so theta is S sparse. If you have this assumption, and then D is large, can you come up with an algorithm that scales uh, with S instead of D? 
or scales better in D and, and maybe at a cost of, of some, some S. So that's something that, um, that, that there is a line of work there. Um, but I guess to, to like address the part of the question of like, how do we come up with the features and how to, how to better come up with the features? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I mean, I think, I think what inspired a bunch of this work is to, is to think about, you know, um, modern approaches to RL, like maybe you want to have some deep learning component that like learns some neural network um, that you then end up acting with. Like maybe the neural network learns the Q star. And if you imagine a neural network, like it, it, it will be, you know, just, just this, this, you know, this like that, a uh, bunch of connections here and there. But if you look at the lo uh, final layer, right? Like if you look at the final layer and then how that, goes into to to like make a q star then in this final layer you can call this your feature right like maybe this is your feature for state s and action a here because what happens here between here and and the final output is is basically a, a linear combination this is an inner product of the weights and the features to, to get this q star uh, or or at least the q star that the neural network thinks is, is the right value. So um, if you had a neural network like this, then the question is like, even if this was a perfect neural network, if it could learn these features really well to represent Q star, let's say all of this is solved and you can, you can learn it very quickly. Like, can you use these features and learn just this final layer, right? Like that should be an easier task. Can you learn that final layer to, to get the Q star and, and the answer is, well, in this case, for the Q star uh, problem, it, it, it is still exponentially hard. So I guess it's, it's separating a, a bigger problem into, into a smaller problem and saying that like even this easier problem is, is kind of super hard. Um, that is how I would look at it. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't deal so much with like, how do you get the features? Uh, that's like another, you know, part of the problem that is still very hard. Uh, but in fact, it makes it even you know harder than than something that's already super hard. So so I guess yeah, that's uh, maybe that's a very pessimistic view. Uh, but but yeah, like it's it's a different kind of line of research which I'm personally not uh, yet uh, involved with. But yeah, people are looking into how to get the, the features as well. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, Chaba, do you want to add anything to this or to anything Yeah, else? I was just thinking about advertising some work I was doing with some Google Brain people. It's an interesting observation. Uh, this question comes up all the time, like where do you get the features from? And uh, there is also linear MDPs that Galliard mentioned previously. And uh, people are asking, the question, oh, how come you have a linear MDP? Uh, would you ever have that? And it turns out that the linear MDP assumption, however outrageous it looks like uh, when you are first seeing it, like you're like, oh, this is not real. It's never going to happen. Um, if you push it a little bit more and you kernelize, uh, move to representing kernel here by spaces, so it's basically infinite dimensional now, but it's still linear. Then it happens to be... Uh, a reasonable class of systems. Uh, so if you have a nonlinear dynamics, uh, so you you have an action, uh, it's in some, sorry, so you have some state, it's in some space, and, and you have finitely many actions. We are we're still just talking about finitely many actions. And the actions effect can be described as a nonlinear function. And on the top of that function, there is some noise, like Gaussian noise, which is uh, which is not crazily heteroscedastic. Then, uh, if the noise has some nice properties, then you can embed the whole transition dynamics into uh, a Hilbert space, and in that Hilbert space, everything becomes linear. So it's like. Basically, no, you exploded the dimension. So it's kind of like answering your question by not answering it because now the dimension is infinite. But then it turns out that uh, you can actually deal with this infinite dimensional systems, uh, which if you look very carefully uh, at all the analysis that we were doing, all the time what matters more than the dimension is these norms 
the various norms of the parameter vectors, the feature vectors, and so on and so forth. So for example, if the feature vectors norms are bounded by one, then what matters in the bounds is typically the norm of the parameter vector. That describes how big the parameter space is. And in an archaeous space, if you have uh, a bounded subset of that, then it that has a bounded capacity as, as far as uh, learning is concerned. So just because the number of dimensions is infinite doesn't mean that you can't learn it. So you can learn those things. Uh, and the techniques are very, very similar to what we are talking about here. So with a slight extension, I would say that you can push this uh, linear uh, view quite a bit, and then it, it feels maybe less limiting. Uh, but, but everything that Galliot was also talking about uh, is, is also a, a relevant and interesting, they are relevant and interesting directions. And uh, that there is no ultimate answer to any of these questions. And, and that's why research is really wonderful, right? Like, we can have yeah, be here forever because they're just not ultimate answers. Like 42 is not good enough for us. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. It's very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, and then with that, we're done. And let's thank Galliot. Cool. Uh, I think he deserves a big, big clapping. Um, <laughs> From me at least. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah. Uh, I hope, hope Galliard, you, you also had fun. Much. Yeah, no, I definitely did. I, I hope it wasn't too confusing, but um, yeah, if it was, especially with the, with the proof here, the last year's lecture, I think, goes over it quite nicely. So, recommend it. I also recommend the paper, which I think was super interesting with uh, showing the differences of ranks. Uh, and yeah. Hope you have fun in the rest Good of the course. Yeah. And, uh, so next yeah. time we're going to have another guest. I, I got a little bit carried away with inviting various people, but, but these are the people who actually do the work. So why not? We get, we get the best lectures this way. All right. Okay. So see you cool. in two days. All right. Bye. Thank you, Galliot. <laughs>